Welcome to the Defiant Weekly. This week, we're looking at play to earn and its evolution into what's now being called GameFi. It's a big deal. It's the financialization of blockchain games. The use of DeFi as a mechanism for helping people who play games earn while they're playing them. And then, of course, on-ramping them into a DeFi ecosystem that can do, well, anything that DeFi can do. So let's take a look at what's going on in the play to earn landscape right now, thanks to our friends at Hulk Crypto. Well, that's a lot of games. And as you probably know, it's quite easy to make a game. It's very difficult to make a good game. We got a bit of stick for even mentioning AAA in the same conversation as Illuvium. All of these games here, none of them are AAA yet. They might get there, but at the moment, no. But it gives you an idea of how much is being built and how much of it plugs into this play-to-earn games landscape. It's a lot, and this isn't all of them either. Global gaming statistics. So this is regular video games. As we know, it's growing rapidly, and it probably hasn't been helped by COVID, everyone having to spend time indoors, but VR, consoles, and the rapid evolution of video cards from NVIDIA 3090s, for instance, yeah, gaming is growing at a rate of nods. And it's also growing because people are now able to earn a living through esports. But there are 2.9 billion gamers on the planet that, as a fraction of the global population, is getting towards a half. Getting towards a half. $174.9 billion spent on video games in 2020. Lord alone knows what it's gonna be in 2021. But this is a big deal. Gaming is massive. Blockchain games make a lot of sense. And as we'll see as we go through this presentation, yeah, it's gonna be big. It is estimated that the global gaming market will amount to 268.8 billion US dollars annually in 2025. Yeah, it's set to be 178 billion dollars this year. Still big in North America, big growth in Asia, but then of course, you know, with Axie Infinity, it's the Philippines, it's Southeast Asia, it's places where we don't normally expect to see gaming, and part of that's to do with mobile gaming, but in-game purchases are estimated to account for more than 74 million US dollars worldwide. 74 million US dollars just in-game purchases. And of course, in regular games, those in-game purchases can't be transferred. It's just literally, you know, it's just what people are spending to have a different experience within the game. Imagine if you unlocked all of that and opened it up to transferable assets, to taking points earned in one game, transferring them to another. You know, it's been talked about for a while, but you can kind of start to see the scope of the opportunity here and why everyone is so excited about it. So the blockchain perspective on this, so this is looking at the volume in the past 30 days. Axie is just massive, absolutely massive. 743,000 users, $2.17 billion in volume. Unbelievable. So... Yeah, big deal, blockchain games, play to earn. There's a lot of crap out there, let's be honest, but I think we can all tell there's something here. And if you think about games that are being built from blockchain first and then out towards the regular video game world, we also have to think about regular video game developers, IRL video game developers, starting to add a DeFi layer or a blockchain layer on top of what they do already that's really going to open the doors to something colossal happening here. And we'll get into all of that just after this message is from our sponsors. Don't let high gas costs keep you out of Ethereum. At Balancer, the gas-optimized vault architecture makes trading cheaper than anywhere else. Liquidity providers can optimize their fee earnings using the dynamic fee system that automatically adjusts to market conditions. You can also use asset managers to lend out idle assets, dramatically increasing your capital efficiency. And because Balancer is an open platform for flexible, automated markets, you can choose from stable pools or weighted pools. And in the future, more designs will be created that we don't even know about yet. Check it out at balancer.fi. Do you want to get actionable insights and find new investment opportunities before everyone else? Well, Nansen is a blockchain analytics platform tracking more than 100 million wallet addresses. Make informed decisions on your yield farming and investments through dashboards like Hot Contracts, Smart Money, and NFT Paradise, and see who's aped into an NFT collection or farm, and look into the behavior of money flows on chain. Sign up now at nansen.ai and become a smarter investor today.
DeFi Saver is one of the essential DeFi apps for advanced portfolio management with tools to instantly leverage up or unwind your positions available for top Ethereum lending protocols such as MakerDAO, Aather, Liquity, Compound, and Reflexer. Famous for its flagship automation features, DeFi Saver is known for saving hundreds of positions from liquidation during major market crashes, such as the one we had in May 2021. By constantly monitoring your positions and automatically making adjustments as soon as needed, it provides you with peace of mind while being away from your keyboard and your keys. DeFi Saver also enables you to combine various DeFi actions, create unique protocol interactions, and execute them in a single transaction using their recipe creator feature. DeFi Saver is your one-stop dashboard for creating, managing, and tracking your DeFi positions. So if we're going to start talking about play to earn, which leads us to GameFi, we have to talk about Axie Infinity. And this chart here just, I mean, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. The growth curve, it's just a monstrous climb, ever upwards, ever upwards, ever upwards. The average monthly player is just climbing through the roof. The active daily player is climbing through the roof. But what you'll notice is that the red line, which is the monthly gain loss, is sort of stable, weirdly. And actually, during the kind of bear market of the spring, it dropped significantly and it's sort of just stabilized now. But there was a point at which this was growing massively and everyone got really excited, of course. We'll get into this a little bit later on and, and the implications of SLB and its its price action in the market. But Axie is where this all begins. And it's the, th you know, it's the project which everyone references as the thing. It's worth bearing in mind that Back in 2017, everyone was talking about CryptoKitties, the ability to breed these kitties and then grow these things. CryptoKitties was a big deal. But Axie probably never looked like it was going to be a big deal, but now it is. And now it's Axie that we refer to in terms of blockchain games and not CryptoKitties anymore. But I, th I remember last year making a film about Avagotchi, for instance, and nobody could talk about NFTs without mentioning CryptoKitties. Now they've just disappeared from the conversation and the the dialogue around NFTs has moved on. That is very clear. This is the AXS token. This is the governance token for Axie Infinity. It's their internal token. And you can see <laughs> the growth year to date, 25,000%. If you bought here, you are now here. You've done very well. Congratulations. Some result. So if you had high conviction about blockchain games, well, there you go. Vindicated. There's a lot of investment coming in. This is just one example. Solana, FTX, and Lightspeed have launched a $100 million blockchain gaming fund. Solana are very serious about NFTs, and they're very serious about gaming. They're not going to be the only ones, though. And why it's significant that Solana have done this is because they have a very strong relationship with FTX. They also have a very high-speed, low-cost chain that should support gaming at scale for low cost. And that's very, very important because you can't do blockchain gaming where you need constant interactions with the chain. On Ethereum, for instance, it just gets too expensive. And if you want to onboard normal people, you have to set the price expectations uh, proportionately to what people can afford. And most people are not DeFi degenerates. <clears throat> Look at this, Ubisoft is making play to own blockchain games. Who are Ubisoft again? Massive French company, Big deal, yes, Ubisoft. Ele Electronic Arts CEO thinks NFTs and play to earn are part of the future of the gaming industry. Well, you know, I was talking about big gaming companies coming in, and they are. So what is play to earn Well, it's a business model that provides financial benefits to all players who add value by contributing to the game world. It's the latest development in the games industry and brings new game concepts and retention models not yet seen in modern gaming. So hopefully if you play video games, you're used to this idea of grinding, which is... You know, you, you play the game over a long period of time and you just keep at it, keep at it and do really menial tasks to level up your characters and create value in your characters within the game. All of that value is locked up inside that game ecosystem and you can't unlock it yourself. It's just simply internal value in an internal economy. Play to earn unlocks that value, unlocks the effort that you put in to a game and gives it back to you and gives you ownership over the assets in a tangible financial sense. That's play to earn. So let's have a look at some of the um, kind of comparisons that we have here. Um, pay to play. You buy a game to play it. Uh, so you buy a license from a digital store or a physical copy. This is how games used to be. You know, you buy a cartridge for your console, you buy a Blu-ray or a CD-ROM for your PC. You 
had to pay to play the game. Nowadays, it's, you know, you download it from a website, but that was the model. Then it was free to play. So you had an always downloadable um, experience. Fortnite's a good example of this. Game's free to play. But there are kind of moments where you can pay to speed up your progress, buy skins. And basically, there's a whole secondary market. So it's like a gateway drug, essentially. You give it to people for free, then they get hooked and then they just want to keep playing or they want to speed up their progress. And this is this idea of freemium. Um, we've seen that in mobile games as well. If game developers didn't want to have ad revenue powering the, the revenue streams in their game, they do a freemium model, so they would throttle the game, make it harder and harder and harder to progress unless you were paying for items to speed up your progress, hence making it harder and harder and harder. It's kind of like... It's kind of like a kind of weird um, cult Ponzi scheme, in a sense. It's not really a Ponzi scheme, but the way that cults will continually charge you to progress through um, you know, a self-help system um, by getting you hooked on it. And there's this sunk cost fallacy as well. It's like, I've come this far, now I need to go further. And there's always the lure of something further. It's addiction mechanics, 100%. But you know, we, I think we know this by now with video games. There's a dopamine hit that you receive when you get what they call an attaboy. You know, it's a little kind of gift or a pro piece of progress that you get through. That's video gaming. It's built into the mechanics of how these things work. And then we get to play to earn which gives games, gamers ownership over in-game assets <clears throat> and allows them to increase their value by actively playing the game. So you put time in, you get something back. And it's not like you don't get something back in these other models. It's just that now you could take this thing that you get and turn it into real money, which wasn't really the case before. So here are some examples. Axe Infinity, of course. You as a player earn uh, SLP, Smooth Love Potion, by battling with your Axie. Uh, you can breed new Axies with SLP or sell them on the open marketplace. Uh, they're so rare, it's a fancy football game using NFTs, so you can um, win rewards and buy and sell digital player cards. It's just like a trading card game. Star Atlas, and this is a huge game. Um, and the token will be generated through in-game mining, market making, and trade. And there's going to be... Um, player versus player missions, uh, PvE missions, and resource gathering, that kind of thing. So just a massive kind of jump in and get, you know, it's a proper grinding game, that one. And then there's Krabada. You can mine, loot, breed, and expand your forces and earn CRA tokens by playing and use them to determine the future of the kingdom. Doesn't that look fun? There's going to be an absolute embarrassment of... I hate to say the word riches, but possibilities in this space if you are a blockchainer. And I suspect that if you're investigating something like the Solana ecosystem or Binance Smart Chain as well, there's going to be a lot of low-cost options that can be easily plugged into um, DeFi mechanics as well. DeFi on BSC is, well, it's its whole own ecosystem and there's a lot of scams on there, yeah, but there's a lot of people that use that chain um, because they just didn't want to be on Ethereum. So there's, user, there's a user base that likes games over there. So it's very, very early days. Um, and even earlier were some of these options. So Gambit um, was a place where you could play very, very simple games for blockchain. And then Bombermine was an early game that incorporated uh, some Bitcoin elements as well. So it's not like blockchain gaming is is new per se. It's just that it's it's finally found its feet in a sense. And I guess it's mainly thanks to DeFi that it's been able to do that. And this is where we get to GameFi. So this quote from Andre is pretty significant. Gamification applied to monetary policies excites me so much. Your funds are becoming gear to use in this DeFi game. Till now, we've been cloning TradFi. Going forward, we go into GameFi. And it was interesting that Andre caught the loot bug a few months back and built his own game on Phantom. But with Andre, we have someone who really understands money, value, DeFi. But now he's building this game layer on top. And the game itself creates addiction, yes. It creates an experience. It allows your interactions with money and finance to be experienced in a way that is ludic. It's fun. It's playful. And that is, that's really going to transform so much of the way we interact with protocols. They will be gamified. And that, that may not necessarily be a good thing. It may trivialize things that shouldn't be trivialized. But 
it just seems like the way we interact with the world through screens, through interfaces, is becoming more and more gamified anyway. So this seems like a logical way to go. So we have uh, a couple of different flavors of play to earn. So P2, P2E, play, pay to play to earn. This is like Axie Infinity. You need to buy three Axies before you can start battling them. At the moment, it costs around about $600. That's quite a lot, really, isn't it? If you kind of take your crypto hat off and start thinking about $600 in the real world, IRL, what could you do with that? Well, quite a lot. And if you're someone who lives in the Philippines, which is the, the hotbed of Axie Infinity, $600 is a lot of money. So rare, similarly, you have to invest money in player cards before you can play. And then you have free to play to earn games. So League of Kingdoms, we have lands which are NFTs and owned by users. So it's free to play and then you sort of slowly level up over time. And there are these two different models, but I suspect pay to play to earn is probably going to be the one that, that sees the most traction initially, but hopefully we see some more free to play to earn. It feels a little bit like freemium model lab, but um, again, some distinctions there to be made. So let's talk about the problem that these games are trying to solve. This Fortnite statistic is crazy. Fortnite alone was responsible for $1.8 billion in revenue, even though the game is free. <clears throat> so this is the thing. You players in Fortnite spend money on stuff to change the appearance of their, their character. But if you stop playing that game, then well, what can you do with it? Absolutely nothing. And lots of games are adding coins and internal currencies into their games because they recognize the value of all of that and what people are prepared to spend on items because it's a kind of clout. It represents who you are. It shows people that you've progressed through a game and there's value in that from an, you know, a reputational point of view. But once you're out of that game, then who cares? I love this quote. Blizzard removed the damage component from my beloved Warlock's siphon life spell. I cried myself to sleep and on that day I realized what horrors centralized services can bring. So this is the pain suffered by one user of World of Warcraft when he realized that all the value and time he'd invested in playing this game had just been rugged at a moment's notice. And who was that person? It was Vitalik. So and this is one of the reasons why Vitalik formed Ethereum, because he realized that that system of centralized value creation was, non, was just not something he wanted to sign up to anymore. And, and this is someone for whom gaming is kind of a big part of their identity and the, the weird kind of world that Vitalik exists in. You can understand why he's obsessed with game theory and de designing systems, but this is where he comes from. So play to earn changes all this. All obtained items represent a certain value. This means you will always be able to make some money the moment you step away from a game. There will always be realizable value. It comes with a caveat, but we'll come back to that in a, in a bit. Um, so even when a gamer needs to pay you to start playing again, these acquired items can always be sold again. So there's a, once you step into this ecosystem, you, you get onto, onto a treadmill and you can start earning by playing and you can keep earning by playing um, even if you step away. And even if you um, just have a simple item that you can sell, you can keep playing the game. It's about agency. And we've talked about this so many times in terms of the metaverse, the ability to create agency for players so that even when you're in a tight spot, there's a way out of whatever spot you find yourself in. I understand that that's a pretty utopian view of all of this, and it won't necessarily be the case. And there's probably a lot of other games that appear to be like this, but aren't. But you know, that's the point. This is an emerging space. And we need to talk about these things and understand how they're working in order to, to create better examples of them. So this Axie phenomenon, Sky Mavis is the company behind it, Vietnamese company, and they were inspired by Pokemon. It's a really simple concept. You have these creatures, you collect them, you breed them, you grow them, and then you set them to work battling each other. I mean, it's exactly like Pokemon, basically. They're represented by ERC-20 tokens, and they can be traded on secondary markets. So there's a free market trade for all of this. Uh, $3.18 billion in volume, over a million in traders, 9 million sales so far. It's just a phenomenon, absolute phenomenon. And we can see here, one went for 369 uh, ETH four months ago. So these are these things are highly desirable at the very top end, the very best axes. 
as we said, $600 to play the game, it's quite expensive. So one of the interesting um, aspects of, of the Axie Infinity ecosystem is this idea of scholarships. So let's say I have a stable of axes and I have people who want to play the game. I can actually sponsor a player with axes so that they can play the game. So that, that scholar, as they're called, will play the game and earn SLP. And I will take a small percentage of the earnings of that player. So I could, you know, as a, as a wealthy patron, I could hoover up a bunch of axes and then I could um, set up scholarships for players and they play and then I just take a cut of it. It's, yeah, it's earning rent from axes. And then there's YGG and YGG is Yield Guild Games. And this is um, essentially, it's a, it's a mechanism for creating scholarships, creating communities of scholarships um, clustered around a token YGG um, to create scholarship programs, not just for Axie Infinity, but also for a bunch of different games that are in this play to earn space. But Axie Infinity is where it starts. This is Gabby Dizon, uh, who's from the Philippines, clearly understands that market extremely well and saw an opportunity here to create something sustainable and wholesome for uh, a community that really wanted this. And I think we've seen the stories now of what happened during COVID when people were literally paying their bills by playing Axie Infinity. There is a degree to which there are some problems with this, this model. Um, I've heard it called slavery. I think that's extreme. But <clears throat> yeah, it's... I don't know. How, how do you feel about it? Let us know in the comments below because I'm, I'm conflicted about this. It, it feels desperate in some ways. It feels exploitative in some ways, but maybe it's not. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm being too harsh on it, but <clears throat> you could see how uh, an entity could exploit um, players that want to you know, be in this, this ecosystem. So I, I kind of have to see how that one develops, but I know YGG are recruiting scholarship managers from their community. Um, so there's uh, opportunities for people to earn an income uh, outside of just playing the game and level up through a community. Uh, and it's growing really fast, really, really fast. So can you really earn a living from P2E? So on average, Axie Infinity players are making $400 a month, which is under the taxation threshold of $5,000 per year here in the Philippines. And the average salary in the Philippines is $3,218. It's humbling, isn't it? Yikes. <clears throat> so the top five countries that play Axie Infinity, Philippines, Venezuela, United States, Thailand, <clears throat> and Brazil. But yeah, Philippines, overwhelmingly. And of course, if all our activities clustered in the Philippines, then is it really representative of the rest of the world? I don't know, but you can imagine that there will be other games maybe built in Latin, Latin American, Hispanic countries that tap into that audience. I don't know. But certainly the Philippines has been leading the way in this regard. People are actually recognizing the fact that playing video games and earning an income from it, that's legitimate work. We've been seeing this narrative for the last five years, that esports is a legitimate way to earn a living. College degrees, sponsorships, scholarships, all these kind of things for something where you sit down and play with your thumbs. I think there's a recognition that there is a huge amount of skill involved and the stress involved in playing these games at the very highest level. Plus, there's a TV audience for it. Look at Twitch. You know, people will spend hours and hours and hours watching gaming. It was telling when we put our Alluvium video out how quickly people jumped on me for saying I wasn't a gamer. I have been a gamer. I am not a gamer now. I've just got too much to do. But I certainly haven't spent any time hanging out in gamer channels, watching gamer content. And that's on me. I should. We are starting to move more into Unreal Engine and more into production that overlaps with gaming technology. We'll have to do our homework because, yeah, there's more that we need to know. And I, ah, I accept that. So what about the risks in all of this? So in the play, pay to play model, which is what Axie Infinity is, you need to put up an initial investment to purchase characters and items to play the game. And it's quite possible that you will overpay. It's quite difficult to navigate your way through the Axie Infinity marketplace and try and understand what represents a good buy or not. There's a huge amount of market volatility. This is the chart for SLP, Smooth Love Potion. Ridiculous. Look at the spike up here. Bang. 
and back down again. That is a monster spike. But then it happened again, again, again. And then this one, bang, up. That was the top of the real hype phase back in May. Bosh, damn. So if you were basically playing the game here and you were projecting your earnings, your income per month based on figures that you calculated up here, you were in for a nasty surprise, bang. But then this was this is even worse because then it, would come, it went back up here. And if you had done that, you would have thought, oh, it was all right, that was just a blip, it was just a bear market. But then boom, back down again, down to here. That's a huge spread between this point up here, around 33 cents, all the way down here to around seven cents. You cannot, in any way, shape or form, project your monthly income and, and think about your overheads, paying your bills, paying your rent, paying for your groceries, based on that. You just can't. It's, the token is way too volatile. Granted, it has settled now, but when I looked on Twitter, I saw so many posts from people just angry, angry at what they perceived was VCs dumping their tokens or you know, people just dumping, dumping, dumping. The, the way markets work is when people are heavily in profit, they start to sell. And then they want to preserve their position. They want to protect what they have. They sell. That is what happens. Unless SLP is a stable coin, this is always going to happen. You can't have a tradable asset like this that isn't pegged to something without the volatility. So uh, when people talk about earning a living through SLP uh, and through playing Axie Infinity, sure, fine. But show me those figures over the course of two years and let's see where we're at and whether it was actually possible. During a bear market, you will see this get crushed even further. It's inevitable. So yeah, I think it's right to be skeptical about that. Um, axes can be stolen, you can be hacked, all of the usual smart contract risks, of course. And Axie's now running on Ronin Chain. Ronin Chain is quite centralized, I'll be honest. And the Katana Dex is very localized. And so if something happens, some kind of FUD happens around Axie, liquidity will be yanked in a heartbeat. And that's problematic for Axie Infinity. It'd be interesting to see whether they take on some bond-based liquidity like Ohm, which I think helps protect against that. But yes, there's always that risk. Environmental concerns. Well, we've heard this narrative around NFTs and how bad they are for the environment. If they're on Ethereum, I'm not going to kind of go any further with that. But I think, you know, it's an easy stone to throw at NFTs and it's probably not legitimate. Uh, but we can now see that there are viable layer one alternatives, Solana, Avalanche, Harmony, Wax. And then there's layer twos as well, like Immutable X. Polygon, of course. Um, there's quite a few games that went on Polygon, like Avogotchi. Curious how Immutable X is going to pick up, but uh, Illuvium is on there, for instance. So definitely low cost, low fee, almost zero fee alternatives, and plenty of DeFi um, to plug in as well. More liquidity, more value to come in and start playing the game. So I think those cons are kind of going away. This is an interesting one. This is a someone that's using bots to farm SLP in Axie Infinity. So I was talking about YGG, uh, which is a guild. So these guilds have formalized the method of lending in-game assets in the form of NFTs. And they're basically a community that pairs people who want to make money playing Axie Infinity with the NFTs they need for starting the game. So it's kind of taking the idea of scholarships and forming a methodology and community around that. Um, and so this is YGD talking about the number of Axie scholars. They have 1,500 plus. Um, but yeah, there's some. this is an emerging category where global communities of scholars can cluster around kind of what will become big brand name guilds uh, to play all sorts of different games. And to hopefully there'll be some educational components to that, um, coaching as well, and maybe the ability to borrow and lend um, different axes and team up together. But you know, this idea of 
formalizing the relationship between players and scholars, I think is going to be a big, 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 big deal. And be interesting to see what happens with YGG, but it's certainly uh, it's making some waves at the moment. So the pros of um, playing play to earn, you've got new and improved revenue stream, value generated in the games doesn't accrue solely to the platform owners and the value doesn't disappear once you start playing. It's all built on smart contracts so we can trust the code most of the time. Uh, it's immutable so you own what you own and no one can say that you don't. And then you have provenance so you know if, if an axie came from a celebrity then you might gain some cred from that but you definitely know where the axie came from you definitely know who its parents were if it was a bred one uh, definitely you can prove the value of your item irrefutably big question here is it decentralized we talked about ronin chain not being that centralized it's not really um, and it doesn't need to be but per se decentralization is a sliding scale um, Yield Guild Games is based around a DAO. So here, token holders can produce and vote on project update proposals. Um, this will have an effect most of the time on the monetary features. So um, the DAO may vote to increase the reward for a certain action within the game as a means of promotion. Um, but YGG's main goal is to generate more revenue, to make more money from the opportunities presented by these play to win games. That's what they're there to do. Um, the jury's out on whether DAO has really kind of fulfilled a brief on full decentralization, but it's certainly better than anything we've had before, that's for sure. Uh, in the Alien World Planet DAO, uh, you can stake TLM, and this, will, uh, s this is how you can support a planet to receive greater daily TLM rewards. So by staking TLM on a planet, players also gain voting rights according to the amount of TLM staked. So again, there's another ecosystem where you can be part of a DAO and, and gain greater rewards. That's in your hands. Um, we also have, like Avogadro when it came out was, was notable because you're able to put um, other tokens into your Avogadro and those other tokens would earn yield. So your Avogadro was a yield generating asset which is pretty cool um so with avogotchi you can purchase purchase and grow avogotchis um and then kind of roam around the digital universe and the rarity score is calculated by specific character traits you've got wearables um and then in DeFi kingdoms on harmony you can swap farm lp and stake and we looked at alluvium earlier this week um this has some fairly interesting staking mechanics built in you get a double booster reward if you stake and lock up for a year um but you can also unlock your your staked rewards early um with a synthetic token that can only be played in game so you've got this hybrid model there and i'm expecting to see more farms more staking opportunities coming up um as we start to see these games mature and how do you on earth do you get started? Well, pick a game, choose a blockchain, set up a wallet, deposit funds, pick between pay to play to earn and free to play to earn, get involved on DeFi mechanisms, have fun. Now this channel speaks quite in depth about DeFi and trying to understand DeFi. Um, it's, it's worth thinking about DeFi really is this. It is money, but decentralized. It is you free to go and pick whatever product you want to interact with without anyone telling you that you cannot. You can get a loan, you can get a savings product. You are free to pick your own path. That's DeFi. The gaming component of this, it's just gonna allow you to extract maximum value from what you have and slowly, slowly over time, because it's a bit of grinding involved, um, get to somewhere where that money is worth a little bit more. But you've had some fun along the way, hopefully as well. But it gives you an opportunity. And I think that's what's interesting about play to earn. I, I am yet to be convinced that play to earn is the model that we're really going to land on as the kind of apex of blockchain gaming. But it's certainly been a big year for play to earn. And I certainly see ways in which it could be improved. But I would love to see what a play to earn system or setup would look like on Terra, for instance, where I feel like there's a really strong um, DeFi ecosystem there. I would love to see it on Polkadot, Avalanche. Yeah, I just want to see this thing mature more. I do have some misgivings about guilds and about scholars and about all of that, but maybe I'm wrong. But I think it's worth kind of, you know, being a little bit circumspect about that because I don't think it's perfect just yet.
So that was a defiance guide to play to earn. Just a kind of top level insight into what's going on here, what the opportunities are, and why this thing has happened in the first place. It's a big world with a lot of games being built, a lot of crap being built, but maybe, just maybe, we will start to see big game companies actually adopt this at scale and turn AAA games into AAA DeFi games. And that really would be something. This was The Defiant. I've been Robin Schmidt. Catch us on the next one. Don't forget to subscribe, like, do all that stuff. Drop a comment. I'll see you on the next one. Peace.